We're down to uh, chapter nine, which is management stuff, really. But this is actually helping. I mean, first I thought this was just fluff, but the more I've, I've been going through this stuff gradually. You know, I've been moving from forensics into defense, and I'm trying, as we do the CCBC and these other things, I'm starting to understand how defense works. And really, defense is moving from being just black magic into a sort of science. And this is a large step of how it works here. So there's a security cycle that happens in your enterprise. And these general principles, I understand them more and more. I've now lived through enough security disasters and such. So uh, what people used to do is just buy some tool, read the manual of the tool, go to the vendor training, and say, there, this tool will solve all our problems. That was like five or six years ago, you go to RSA, everybody would come to you and say, for $100,000, you can buy our enterprise security gateway, and it will solve everything. And if that was only true, that would be swell. But we know that's not true because of the advanced resistant threats. That came out in 2010 and thereafter, we found out that uh, you, there's nothing you can buy that will actually save you. So just learning how to run one tool is not enough. So you're going to have to, instead of being tied to a tool, you're going to have to have um, a goal. And your team is going to have to achieve their goal by doing whatever choosing whatever tools are necessary, or maybe writing their own tools. So you got an SIEM tool, which is not tied to one SIEM device, Security Information Events Manager. They're tied to the goal of actually detecting intrusions by whatever means are necessary. And the primary tool will, of course, be one of the SIEMs like Splunk, but they'll have other ones. Then you have um, antivirus. I'm not sure. There's another team here in the data loss prevention team. I guess that's the antivirus team trying to stop malware. And then there's data loss prevention team watching your outgoing data. And so their goal is to prevent these things. Um, so that's, that's when you tie into specific products. But instead, we're going to tie them to uh, what their goals are here. So here's the cycle. And first, I thought this document was silly, and I got to like it better. So you have planning to prepare yourself to be secure. So this is things like finding out what your assets are and doing things like pen testing and red teaming where you figure out what might happen to them. And then you have plans to resist it with things like firewalls, antivirus, and preventive tools. And this is all we used to do. We used to think this would work, but we found out that's not good enough because there's nasty people out there like the foreign military uh, that will just blast through this and get in. So now you have to detect when all this has failed and somebody is in there doing the bad thing. And then you have to somehow respond and kick them back out again before they get the goodies. And then you have to, after you've done that, you have to have a post-mortem where you analyze how well did this work, how are we going to improve our static defenses so that won't happen again, and how are we going to improve? So you have to have this constant cycle. This will then lead you back to make more plans about, well, now that we know we got hacked, how do we stop it next time? Put it in here. and on it goes. All these things are happening all the time by different teams, but the result is to constantly improve your security posture. And this is the big rule of all security and other things in organizations now. You have to have a self-improving cycle of your company because if you don't, the world is changing so fast that you won't even hold still. You will fall behind. If you're not racing just to keep up with the progress of the world, you'll become obsolete. And that's the big issue. So uh, the planning goals, your idea here is to figure out how to protect your company. So you're going to position your organization to make it hard to break into with just good policies like password policies and firewall policies and stuff to make it hard to get in. So you're going to try and figure out what, you, what um, attacks you're really having to face and um, prepare yourself to, to block those attacks. So you're going to have to have things like budgeting, compliance, training, software development, a secure software development, so you aren't using known vulnerable products. And then you're going to have assessment, where you try to figure out how secure you are before you get hacked with adversary simulation, pen testing, red teaming, are people who don't necessarily do pen tests, but they do various kinds of thinking about how we would attack things. Your general, you have your offensive team that is pretending to be a hacker and trying to see the weak spots in your process. And if you can do that, the better you can do it, the more real attacks you can get rid of, supposedly. Then you got resistance. After you have figured out what your plans are, now you put in some kind of automated countermeasures like firewall and antivirus and whitelisting, DLP devices. And these have some automatic um, defenses that repel some intruders. Your weaker intruders will not get past this. That's the idea. Then you have your administrative countermeasures, just good policies, where your users are aware of what mistakes not to make, and you have 
administrative configuration and vulnerability management so you don't let people just bring in devices from home and plug them in and you check everything before it gets installed and you monitor things to see if somebody is altering devices to make them risky again. And if you have these things working well, then it's harder for low-level attackers to get through. Once the attackers do get through, now you have to have detection and response. And so you're going to have to collect all this data that we've talked about here, things like application logs and network data and host data. And you may have data coming from third parties, and you have a data coming from your constituents. Now, if you're a politician, you have constituents. You represent these people, and they can call you with complaints. And that's where your book likes to think of the security analyst, that your company, you have like users and help desk and management, and those are your constituents. You're representing them to protect them, and they will have requests which you have to interpret, like the people will call and say, that's, that's, that's what he means by this constituent stuff. You have a certain position of responsibility, and people are calling you saying, you should do it different because what you're doing is affecting me. Anyway, then, um, once you've gathered all this data, then you have to somehow do something with the data, and there's two general things you can do. One is you can look for known signatures of bad behavior, and that's worth basing on uh, indicators of compromise, like MD5 hashes, known files, this is sort of what antivirus does, and, firewall, and uh, layer seven firewalls and such. And the other thing you can do is hunting, where you just look for trouble in there without a signature, because this is the most advanced skill where you can look at stuff and spot badness in it because you just sort of know what's there. This is your most senior analysts can do this. They call it hunting. And so your beginners start here just seeing if you match known bad rules. And after they understand the system more and more, they can hopefully regress up to here as the highest skilled level where they can spot zero days and kind of say, this doesn't look right, even though it doesn't exactly match a rule. Once you've found a bad thing, now you've got to escalate it. You've got to take response you got to tell somebody else to do something about it and get people involved. So you have to notify your constituents, we have a security problem and you have to do something about it. Then you can create new indicators of compromise, new collection requirements, and new analysis requirements to go back there. And then down here, you're going to have responses to actually resolve the problem. Kick out the bad guy, notify the federal agencies like Uber should have done hey, if right. you lost their data and, and that sort of thing. That's all part of your resolution. You haven't resolved the incident until you have complied with all the regulations overseeing you. So um, there's also something at the bottom here showing the steps, which we'll talk about more later. Um, so <coughs> you're collecting data, and the goal here is to figure out if what you've got is normal data or suspicious or malicious. Um, and you're analyzing it. Uh, once you have some idea that this is a malicious event, then there's two kinds of analysis. The one is focusing on IOCs, and the other is not focusing on IOCs, which one is matching and the other is hunting. Then escalating is notifying somebody else about the asset. This is when you notify a constituent that something has happened and this server is now compromised and we have to do something about it. And then resolution is what you do to reduce the risk of loss. And there's a lot of issues to consider there, which we'll get there. So collection is a technical process of uh, picking up logs or network packets or something else from devices. Now that's the technical process, which is what we focused on here with things like Splunk or Security Onion. And then there's non-technical collections. You've got third parties like law enforcement and your business partners that may be contacting you. This is, um, there's t-shirts floating around that say, Brian Krebs is my uh, IDS. <laughs> yeah, right. Because Brian Krebs, will, Brian Krebs has contacts in the credit card companies. And when they see a lot of fraudulent use of credit cards from the same company, they tell him. And he then calls the company and say, somebody hacked you because a bunch of people from your restaurant chain have all had fraudulent credit cards. So this is most companies, this is how you find out you've been hacked. Somebody on the outside calls you because they detect the damage before you detect anything. Because they don't have any effective monitoring, they are unable to detect it inside the network. And if Brian Krebs does it, that means it's very, very bad. <laughs> yeah, Brian Krebs does it. it, then it's a disaster because it's already public and he's going to publish it. And that's, of course, we'll have levels of this coming later, but the top level is when it's a public scandal and there are lawsuits and government regulatory agencies hurting you. That's the disaster from viewpoint of management. That's what you're hoping to avoid. You would really like to catch the problem before it becomes a public disaster. <laughs> All right. Um, so. Here's your technical sources. There's a lot of tools out there to do it. 
Mondiant, uh, you could have passive sort of recovering where you're just watching logs and packets like we did with Security Onion. You can also have probing products that reach out and send queries to the end devices to see what they've got. And Mandiant has a variety of those. There's Redline, it's the early one. This is another one, Mandiant for intelligent response. This is basically, I found that these products, when I tried to use them in my IR class last time I taught it, they'll come by in another year, they really didn't seem to work well enough to be worth the bother. It's much better to just write a script. You send out a query, you get a response. If you're on Windows, you use WMIC or PowerShell. You can ask the endpoint, tell me about this registry key, tell me about this file, tell me about this network traffic, and that's productive. Um, but anyway, there's a variety of ways to do it. You can sweep the enterprise to find out where the intruder has been, and you can then do target analysis of particular victim computers. Uh, there are commercial products, too, that do this. Um, they have remote access to the hard drives and RAM, and like I mentioned, there you can just do a lot of it with plain old Windows tools, like WMIC is a command line tool that will let you query almost anything about a Windows system, and uh, System Terminal's PS Exec will let you run any program you want at the other end, like RegEdit, to find out about registry keys and things like that. But you can very easily write command line scripts that will harvest information. The, and this is where real efficiency comes in, because if you were to make images of all the hard drives, you'd have a thousand gigabytes of data and you'd spend a week crawling through it, and that's nowhere. You have to have something that will give you a reasonable amount of data that's actionable. And then there's network collection. Um, we've covered quite a few of those, things like Wireshark and SGUIL and, and those other products we've seen. Um, these, there's these interpretive products like Splunk that try to take the raw network data and summarize it in something you can understand, like this is an Nmap scan, this is a ransomware event, things like that. And this all comes from your application logs and your network traffic, but it's processed in a way to make it more digestible, make it easier to spot the important stuff in the midst of all the unimportant normal traffic that's out there. So you have a log source someplace, which is some part of the application that records something, and then you have a collector which uh, stores the data and something that transports it to the uh, SIEM device. So ELSA might be collecting it, and then syslog is the transmission medium, and it ends up at a central point so you can analyze it. Host data, you can get on demand, where you interrogate a host and cause it to tell you about things. Um, this is different than logs. Logs are regularly created so they reflect the normal operation of the server process. But if you have an indicator of compromise, when we're infected, this file is going to be created, you will ask about that file, and that file is not probably something that would appear in a normal log. Because it wasn't put there by one of your server processes, it was put there by malware, so you've got to ask for it. And that's the point. This MIR product and other products can do this and ask, is a mutex in memory? Is there something in the registry? Is there a file in the file system? You know, these things that I know to ask you. Um, and here's the, the numbers. Only one third of companies detect their own intrusions. The other two thirds find out about intrusions from somebody outside, frequently law enforcement. The FBI comes in and says, you know, we caught the criminals. We impound their, their server and your data was on the server. This is what Google did in 2010 when Google split the whole APT thing open wide. China hacked Google around Christmas. They got really, the CEOs of Google got personally mad and they went public, which no one else had ever done. And they also went to hack the Chinese back and steal it all back. And they found 30 other companies' data on the Chinese yeah. servers. Microsoft, Adobe, everybody. And they went to them and this, dude, the Chinese have been hacking you and you didn't even notice. Google at least noticed for whatever, that's, that's an accomplishment of sorts, but still they're all totally getting hacked. And at that time, that's when there was a big wake-up call for the industry. There is nobody you can hire and nothing you can buy that will stop the Chinese from hacking you. This is disturbing. <laughs> and they invented all this stuff we've been covering to try to respond to that ridiculous situation where why is it the Chinese can just sail right into my network, right through all my stuff, and steal my stuff? That's not what I want. So, And remember, users will complain too. Users will, you, um, some people like to ignore user complaints. But this is all, this is not a good idea. I remember when I worked in an escrow agency, we would mail checks out to people and people would call and say, I got the wrong check. And we didn't ignore that at all. We would say, let me make a record, let me pass it on the supervisor. If you can, fax us an image of the check because it's possible that we're sending out the wrong checks. And if so, we really want to find that out quickly before everybody cashes them. And it becomes nearly impossible to recover the money. And a couple of times that did happen where some, there was a mistake in the database and some people were getting the wrong checks. 
and you really so when users tell you that something bad is happening it would be good to correctly interpret is this user just crazy or is this my warning that something bad is happening so then there's the intrusion kill chain that people have so um your your attackers have some kind of goal like they want to steal your proprietary data so first they analyze your company from the outside then they develop some kind of weapon deliver it somehow like with, with email with an email attachment then they exploit some server because they've got some foothold into your machine so now they have one machine and they try to escalate install some stuff remote control it and then perform their action and so while they're going through that kill chain you've got chances to detect them you might notice them scanning your server to scrape your server to get all the data. You might notice um, the data coming into email. Your users might tell you about phishing attempts and so on. Your endpoint assessment might tell you somebody is installing malware on the endpoints. And you might be able to see transactions as data is, as commands are going back and forth to the command and control server. And these are your opportunities to stop them before they steal the data. Yeah. Just in the kill chain now, um, yeah. more and more third party kind of like intrusions happen. That's happened with WannaCry. Oh, when yeah. They didn't really go to the company, but they figure out what tax software all this company used, and they hack the tax company and put their ransomware in the update. So even so, your company have all of this stuff, and you really, really watching, and most of the companies have pretty good security. They didn't expect that it will come as an update from the legitimate software they've been partnered for like 15 years. Yes, this is a very good point. Yeah. And there's there's been a, a lot of those, I know that that's how they got in Target. They got it through the heating, yep. ventilation, air conditioning company, which had some login to do something on the servers. Uh, that's how they got into BART. Anonymous hacked BART. They couldn't hack BART. They hacked a partner called MyBART, that had some BART data, so they were able to create their goal, which was to embarrass BART, uh -huh. even though they couldn't penetrate BART. They were able to leak some BART data and hurt some BART users and accomplish their goal. So it is a huge problem. You're right. It, you, you have your vulnerability service surface includes not only your stuff, but all your partner's stuff and all your supplier's stuff. And that's why people are really worried about Kaspersky and Huawei. If you're using software and equipment manufactured by your enemies, then you're just asking for it. <laughs> and uh, so we're, that's why we're trying to move away from that. We really ought to be using stuff made by us or our allies. <laughs> that would make a whole lot more sense. Anyway, so um, you've got data coming in, you've got uh, processes to handle reports from third parties, and you have a database someplace to uh, handle all this stuff and organize it so you can efficiently search through it. Uh, this is what you need. And of course, the whole point of this whole chapter, and really the whole course, is this is all new. Your average company 10 years ago had no patience for any of this. Look, we manufacture cars, don't talk to me about computers, just get lost, we're just not going to get hacked, don't worry about it. And now they still want to just make something like cars, but increasingly they are being compelled to do all this stuff. And so they're gradually evolving towards more and more of this stuff from just having like one IT guy that's supposed to solve our IT problems and when we get hacked just yell at the IT guy. That's the model until maybe five years ago that people say, you know, that's really not working. <laughs> Instead of just blaming the IT guy, we're going to have to actually ramp up the staff because our one IT guy, it's not just that our IT guy is an idiot, one IT guy just can't save us anymore. <laughs> we need a whole team. <laughs> I think a big precedent yeah. was created with uh, Volkswagen, where they tried to blame their engineer to modify yeah. software to pass the checks. Yeah. And I think the European court said, like, no, you can't do that, and yeah. they find the company. No, well, that's certainly true. I mean, this is a, I think a few people tried that. Um, you can't blame the line soldiers for military action. The general's responsible. I mean, if you hired an idiot and they did something rotten, the owners are still responsible for hiring an idiot and not overseeing them, or hiring a lunatic, or, or giving them orders to do the wrong thing. It's the same thing that Equifax tried to do. They said, like, oh, it was just a mistake by one employee yeah, yeah. not updating something. It's like, well, no. <laughs> of course, technically that is true, but that also means why doesn't management training the employee, supervising the employee, firing them and replacing them, and you're still responsible exactly. for making sure that your employees are doing the right thing. That's management. But, you know, I'm yeah. just thinking that, you know, for like <clears throat> mid-sized or small-sized uh, companies, even startup, yeah. especially startup, 
how do they even can get a budget for ticketing system, monitoring, and as well as swap? Well, I, mean, I, also I, I know how it happens. From all the people I know in the industry, they say, all you've got to do is wait for them to get hacked. Oh. Yep. And about the fourth time they get hacked, they'll start coughing up the dough. <laughs> Which is only reasonable. I mean, they will expend money on this when they're actually losing money from being hacked. That's what will convince them. Now, the smarter companies might wise up, and when their business neighbors get hacked, they might see it coming. But most of them wait until they get hacked. Like you ask, how long is it before you actually started backing up your stuff? How many times did you really have to lose something important? I had to really lose something yes. seven times before I finally wised up and started backing things up. That's usually how it goes. Uh, I think it's. <laughs> You can clearly see it with uh, backup industry and ransomware. Yeah. When ransomware came up, backup industry just skyrocketed. Because suddenly everybody mm -hmm. was like, oh, we have to have backup. That's right. That's it. That's it. And, and realistically, I'm not even sure this is wrong. I mean, there's a million things that might happen. You don't really want to waste money on them until they're happening. And once it's really happening to you or the people like you, then it's time to really seriously spend money on it. Yeah, you just hope you wouldn't be the unfortunate first one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, because there's always a, you'll, you'll go broke if you try to spend on everything you could be afraid of. And for a long time, it was really hard to advocate for security measures in your company. And yeah. only in recent five years, that changed. That's why I went to uh, RSA a few years ago, and, and Kevin Mandia was there, the, the head of Mandia. And he said, oh, I guess I'm the one on stage that has the guts to say it. The best thing that ever happened in security was LulzSec. They're the best sales engineers I ever had. Everybody's buying our stuff now. Because they're hacking everybody. Everybody's good and afraid. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing they could do for me. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so um, so you got to anal analyze your stuff and decide whether it is good traffic or indicators of compromise. And of course, if you have specific, once you define indicators of compromise, it becomes more more practical to detect them. And this is observable evidence. So Mandiant, um, for example, publishes these. This was the big thing that created, that guided everyone to follow Mandiant down this path. Mandiant invented it. They were the people that decided to do something about Chinese hacking. And they went public with a lot of their data. After Google went public, uh, before that was all being kept secret, and AP, they made APT1 through APT23, which are different um, nation state hacker groups. And APT1 was the main Chinese one, and they dumped hundreds of pages of data about it out there. So this big um, paper came out detailing exactly who they are, where they are in China, what their goals are. And this is all part of Chinese government policy. China to find a five-year plan, saying we are tired of being behind economically and technologically. We have a five-year plan to catch up with the West. And what I don't think they said publicly was that the five-year plan consisted of stealing technology from other nations to catch up. And I, I don't think they bothered to make it public or explain it, but it seems to me like under a communist system, they don't feel like this is wrong. They don't feel like individuals should be able to invent something and then patent it and get rich off it if they make something, it should be available for the benefit of the world. So rather than having to pay what it costs to buy technology from the West, they want to just steal it. They feel justified in stealing it, and they totally just stole it. And they weren't even subtle about it, and we just let them do it for a long time because it was, uh, people didn't feel like admitting it was happening, and then they didn't have anything, any easy way to stop it. So it went out there like crazy, started in 2006, and here's the number of companies getting hacked per year up till 2013, more and more and more companies, and you can see what they're doing. The Chinese goal was to get technology, so the primary thing they hacked was information technology companies, and the primary, it's scientific companies, engineering, research, they were not trying to steal money, they were trying to steal scientific research, product designs, source code technical products. They're trying to improve their technology. They were aware. Here we are making you know, bamboo things. They're making routers. This is no good. We're going to steal their router designs and make Chinese knockoff routers, and that'll be a whole lot better. And that's what they did. They were, and on the grand scheme of human, uh, human enterprise, you could say they're just catching up. But now we did this. They're breaking our monopoly on this intellectual development that we developed over decades over here. They can steal it in maybe five years, and suddenly they're up there making stuff as good as us, and now they're making supercomputers better than us. So yeah. overall, it worked. It was a gigantic exchange of knowledge from the supposedly secret information in the West to China, where they can use it, and it happened. And uh, people can, you can turn blue in the face yelling about it, but it happened, for better or worse. 
But we eventually reached the point over here where we would like to stop this from happening because everybody else can do rotten things. And you really just can't let everybody just crawl through your network and steal everything forever. Sooner or later, you've got to get a handle on it. So um, your best analysts will do hunting, and they may even do friendly forest projection. Now, as we found out with Snowden, the NSA got a little vigorous about this friendly force projection, where your own security team intrudes on your stuff to find out what's happening and see if a bad thing is happening. So the NSA hacked Yahoo and Google and everybody and stole their stuff, supposedly for our benefit, but not exactly with our consent. So that created a scandal, but your own security team is, of course, justified to do it in your own company, and that's a call friendly force projection, where you push out more monitoring tools to see what's going on in a way that hopefully doesn't disrupt business. This is, these are the really advanced things. Your most advanced analysts can detect stuff without signatures, and they can decide when it's time to take action to stop future threats. Uh, the guy that claimed to hack an airplane, um, I don't remember his name right there. There's a famous hacker about four years ago. He rode an airplane. He found a USB port. He plugged something in the USB port, and he put on Twitter, I managed to make the airplane swerve off course by sending signals to the USB port. So when he, the plane landed, the TSA grabbed him, and he had a discussion that was not pleasant with those guys. Sid Dragon, that's his handle. And I saw him give a headline talk after that, and he said, the lesson I learned is you should not ask for permission. Next time you find a vulnerability to a company, you should just hack in and fix it for them. And they'll be grateful, and I'm like, oh. No, no, but anyway, no, no. that's what they're talking about here. But if it's inside your company, hopefully, you have more chance of understanding when you should be adjusting things and being able to get feedback. But I mean, the idea, you have to actually understand a system really well before you can fix things. And you really ought to ask for permission anyway. Anyway, so anyway, the, um, so you uh, examine data, sometimes occupy the systems to find out more. And these are your senior investigators that perform hunting trips. And they typically bring along the middle level investigator with them to learn as an apprentice, how do we do this? Now you look at this stuff, here's how you figure out the good from the bad. Sounds pretty great. I certainly don't know how to do this, but maybe we'll get there someday. So intrusions are what you're trying to find. These are uh, somebody getting in where they don't belong. There are various ways to define it. An incident is some kind of unacceptable action on your computer network. And there are some categories of intrusions. These are the ones I mentioned before. Here's, I think, came originally from the military, maybe the Navy, this idea. So the weakest is category six. Somebody performed reconnaissance and learned something about your network that is really not good for them to have. They didn't steal social security numbers or something, but they learned something like what kind of software you use. So that's reconnaissance. Um, then you have categories one, two, and three, where they have some degree of compromising an asset with data on it, but you don't think they actually stole the data. This is what you mostly hear in breach notifications. Uh, an unauthorized person logged into a server, but we don't think they stole the data. Um, then this is not a breach. This is just a security incident where something bad has happened, but it's not a breach until they actually steal your secrets. Down here are people that stole your secrets. Now you've got to do breach notification, buy people credit monitoring, apologize in the press, fire the CEO, or fire the chief security officer. Now you're going to have trouble. So the worst is where they actually exfiltrated sensitive data or they exfiltrated non-sensitive data, like your network security data that would help them get more or they established a command and control channel where they could have taken data onto a machine with data in it and you don't think they actually got it. These are breaches. And then there's crisis, which is if you get even worse. Uh, and so this is where they publicize stolen data online. Data loss prompted government or regulatory investigation or lawsuits. And here's where it actually caused physical harm or loss of life. And one cry was all the way down here yeah. by the end. It Although it was not the stolen data that caused it, it was just the outage that caused it, but they certainly caused death in Britain. I mean, they shut down several hospitals. And WannaCry was very arguably the NSA's fault. Microsoft came out and specifically said WannaCry was because of the NSA. And that's why the NSA has enormous political and morale problems in their external facing right now. A lot of people hate them. And in their internal morale inside their company, the NSA is going through a very hard time of soul searching and witch hunting and everything else as they, their whole business model is being called into question both inside and outside. Is it really okay for them to be finding all this stuff and keeping it secret and hacking people with it and then letting the Russians steal yeah, it? <laughs> this, this current model is totally not working and things have to change. But exactly how to change them, nobody knows. But it's getting yeah. 
stole, stolen and then it's getting like in the public so That's anybody right. now can use it. And so a bunch of people are saying you should just tell the companies and let them patch it yeah. because it's going to go public anyway and that way at least it wouldn't turn into one of cry type disasters. But they want to have the ability to hack into things. Yeah. Otherwise there's no reason for them to exist so it's a big problem. Anyway, I got some, uh, uh, thought I had some cahoots coming up pretty soon here. I do. We're almost up to them. All right. So there's event classifications. Um, so when you when you record an event, you should have the user ID and an analyst, the time, and a comments field, and then forward these events and um, have some ability to discuss them and then aggregate them to decide what they mean. Um, two key metrics you should have is you should count how many um, met, how many events happen and classify them so you can make statistics how many events of different categories happened then you should record the time because we're going to have a lot more about this later. This is how you determine the quality of your security team, is how quickly do we detect things and how quickly can we actually stop things. That is very, like I say, most companies I've dealt with can't even detect it at all and when it happens they have no idea what to do about it. But after you get over that, you start doing something about it, then this is the rating of your real skill. How quickly can you find stuff and stop it? So escalating is when you're uh, Instant response team documents your findings, notifies constituents, and receives acknowledgement from your constituents. You have to make sure they're actually listening to you, and it's not just sitting in their mailbox. Um, so you create a record, and you create a record of the event and your work to handle it. You make sure you keep an incident number that's unique for every instant and every computer, so you can have a meaningful count of how many things were affected. And uh, there is a vocabulary recommended for these things uh, at link 9b. There's a uh, document put out there to try to specify the sort of things you want to record about each event. Um, this is what our CCDC team has not been doing yet, but this is the next step forward. We say you should be submitting event incident reports for when you get hacked. Let's say we found this guy, he got in, we kicked him out, and tell management. You make a lot of points by doing that. So you identify the asset, you figure out who is responsible for that asset, and then you tell them that they have to do it. So this is certainly what stopped me. I used to do a lot of this stuff. I may get back to it now that I decided it's probably all right, but I used to find vulnerabilities at colleges and tell them. And invariably, there is nobody at the college who is responsible for anything. Certainly it's true around here. Nobody's responsible for anything. And so you can just email the seat. I, I, the president of the college, the network guy, the security guy, they'll all just throw it away. You say, who, you know, your web server is being owned by, the, by criminals. Who feels like they should do something about that? And it's all, ask somebody else. I'm busy today. You know? I think it's a big deal, at least in uh, our community. Right? I work with a lot of analysts, and they're like, oh, okay, I found all this data, but there is no way for me to actually prosecute the guy. Sometimes it takes months to shut down, like, obviously, phishing infrastructure. And they just, you know, hopeless. Oh, kind of. Well, that's, that's another issue. I mean, actually prosecuting guys, I thought it was funny. I went to a, a Secret Service meeting. I go to these... Uh, high-tech crime investigator meetings. And the law enforcement guys were there. And um, one of the guys was up there from some company like Mandiant saying, well, you know, most companies, I don't know why you even bother doing threat identification. You know, mostly you just want to save your equipment. Prosecuting the bad guys is just not going to benefit your business at all. It's essentially impossible. They're often across borders. So we don't bother with that. And one of the law enforcement guys said, hey, wait a minute. Some of us would actually like to prosecute the bad guys. That's actually our priority. I said, well, you law enforcement guys, you have a priority to do that. But the rest of us just want to make money at our business. And kicking them out is really all we want to do. <laughs> Actually, hunting them down is really not going to gain us anything. <laughs> it looks bad on the company, too. Yeah, it can, because it's often somebody in your company involved. You know, That's why it's a, there's an internal. Most people have no real interest in prosecuting. They just want to run their company. But if you're a nation state or a critical access or part of the government, then it becomes more important to figure out who did it and actually punish them in some way. But your typical company doesn't have the ability to punish people. Now, there are companies with incredible delusions of grandeur, like Google. Google moved into China, and they complied with China's Great Firewall, and they're censoring the Internet. And they said, we are doing this because we will be able to influence China once you get in. Google thinks they can shove China around. Uh -huh. Now, they found out what the, everyone else found out, that if you think you're going to shove China around, you're going to find out that you are not going to shove China around. You've got another thing coming. China is big, and they have reasons to do what they're doing, and your opinion does not matter. <laughs> and Google found that out the hard way. Even if you're Google, China does not care what you think. 
<laughs> I heard quite a few Google CV trying to go back there begging for business and they just yeah. get kicked in the face. Yeah, there's a ton of money to be made there, but if you think you're going to tell them what to do, that's not how you're going to make it. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, the, your author wrote a nice list of what it is to be a defensible network. And this makes sense. I mean, you can't reasonably protect your network unless you have set up certain architecture. Here's things you have to have. You have to have some kind of monitoring so you can see what's going on in the network. You have to have everything inventory. You have to know where your assets are. For example, BART. Uh, apparently did not really know how many copies of their data were being used by business partners. So if you, and this is actually very common, that companies have people like in sales buying Amazon servers and putting data up there and nobody even knows. So if you ask them like how many copies are there of all important data, they don't actually know. And people are putting on thumb drives and their Gmail account and their Dropbox and they say, actually we really don't know how many copies there are of this all important data. And that would be, you better knock that off. You want to know what you need and where it is. Then you control it. You should have some control over everything so you can permit authorized activities and deny everything else. And you have to have things claimed. There should be an owner of every system, every data. So when you have something to tell someone about your server, like your server has been compromised, there should be a way to find out who's responsible and they should answer the damn phone and really be responsible for that. They should understand it is my job to be responsible for this asset. And when there's a problem, you have to tell me. This is why I always put my name on everything. I'm not trying to become famous. If anybody has a problem, I want to hear it. You know, If anybody objects to anything I'm doing, especially in the early days when I was much more worried about being accused of breaking the law. I wanted to make sure to have my name on everything. So if anybody has a problem with it, let me know. You should minimize your risks by hardening your equipment so you don't have unnecessary things running. You don't run default servers. You remove all the services you're not using. Uh, everything should be assessed. You should be testing with compliance monitoring such so you know the current security posture of your devices. You should keep things updated. This is what happened to uh, what Equifax, right? They didn't put on their patches. They got hosed because they didn't have an effective updating. And they're saying, well, you know, it's that, it's that guy that didn't put on the update. It's his fault. I said, well, it's management's fault for not having a proper posture of making sure stuff gets updated. <laughs> and then you should have some way of measuring your performance at all these things and improving it. Or none of this is really happening if you haven't measured the degree to which it's happening and constantly improved that. And so this is what you need. You have to have all this working before you have any real hope of defending your network. So it's a big cultural shift to move up to that. And I've got a few cahoots about this. And I see it's just about time to do this. And then we can take a little break. All right, five questions. All right, so what phase includes escalation? All right, it's part of response to escalate. All right. What phase includes pen testing? Something we focus a lot on around here. All right, that's part of your planning phase because it's not a real attack. It's not a re pen testing is how you find vulnerabilities in order to hopefully patch them before bad guys attack you. All right. So an attacker defaces your website. What category of intrusion is that? It's a minor one, cat one to three. That's why this is what, you know, the white hat hackers that like to get attention, they say, this is what you ought to do if you're not willing to like notify people. It's just put a joke on the website. It doesn't really hurt anybody and it kind of forces them to look at their security. Although it's technically illegal, it's a minor, it's not a breach, it's not a crisis, it's just a minor failure of security. All right. So a ransomware attack hits the news and leads to a lawsuit. Now what have you got?
That's a crisis, of course. Yeah. It did not actually involve stolen data, but this is the worst of all possible worlds. Now you're actually being punished publicly, oh, yeah. humiliated, your stock is falling. That's, you were hoping to stop it long before it got that far. All right. Your organization doesn't know how many copies of the sensitive data they made. What's missing here? A lot of companies are in this position, but it's not a good position to be in. I think with cloud technologies, I don't think there are like any, I know one company who does uh, this kind uh -huh. of like inventory of like what yeah. you put in your cloud, but. Oh, there's products that's what um, uh, Cloud Passage makes that product. There's, okay. a, there's a bunch of posh, you know, buy things just for this reason. Yeah. To monitor your cloud assets. So of course, this is, you don't have an inventory. Obviously, you can't protect your assets if you can't even make a list of what all your assets are. So, um, like I say, you've got to have systems and owners. If you, if you can't notify anybody if you cannot map an IP address to a real computer, so when you look at the network traffic, you know which computer is hacked, determine its owner, and contact the owner. If you don't know where the computers are and who's responsible for each one, then you can't notify anybody. And this is what I lived through with all these college breaches. I find something wrong at the college, and I can't do any of this. I can't really say which system was hacked, and nobody cares. This is common. So yeah, for instance, uh, defining what notification depends on the severity, of course. Um, realistically, um, you would telephone or IM someone important if you have an urgent disaster, like hackers are in there right now stealing the all important stuff, um, and you'd have backups in case the original contact is unresponsive. Um, some constituents will not answer because they don't want to hear it. They're busy with other work. They don't really think it's their duty to do anything about it. They cannot understand your technical notification. This happens to a lot of people at bug mounties. There was a guy that hacked Facebook about three years ago, and he was not a native English speaker. He hacked Facebook, and he sent in a report, and they ignored him. And then he sent in another report, and they ignored him. Then he got really mad, and he hacked Zuckerberg's wall. Yeah. He put something on Zuckerberg's <laughs> wall, and then he went public and said, Facebook is bums. They ignored me. And they published his letter to them, and I would have ignored it, too. It was, you couldn't understand it. It was broken English, some technical gobbledygook. You say, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. And I see how it happens from their side. You get a lot of these mails from crazy hackers saying something is wrong, and often you can't figure out whether they're real or not. Yeah. The guy is from Palestine. He's what? He's from Palestine, Palestinian. From, oh, from Palestine, yeah, yeah. They're all over the place. And, and he wanted some money. He would have been happy to get a bug bounty from Facebook, but, but you don't get the bug bounty unless you actually communicate effectively to them. They didn't pay him. No, they didn't pay him. Well, they, after he hacked him, they certainly couldn't pay him. They don't want to encourage that. Yeah. But it's, um, he was right, but he was not able to make an effective report that someone could understand at the other end. People say that uh, they, didn't, they didn't understand his English, so that they didn't pay him. Well, that's right. I mean, because you haven't really reported it if the person at the other end can't understand your report. But anyway, it's an issue. So a lot of people depend on the computer, uh, your incident response team to figure it out. So anyway, you want to track acknowledgement. I've certainly saved myself many times at this. When I used to work in the legal business handling data with lawyers, the one thing I instinctively knew right at the start was to always tell everybody everything. Every time someone asked me to do something, I would reply with an email to everybody, the prosecution, defense, and my boss, okay, this person asked me to do this, I'm doing this. This is a really good thing. <laughs> then everyone knows what I'm doing, and they all approve it before I do it. Uh, that's the only way to handle because it's other people's money. I'm not doing anything with somebody else's money without their approval. Anyway. So um, if you're compromised, then the attackers probably can read your company email because they have hacked into your company email server, so you really shouldn't be sending emails back and forth. This is what Kevin Mitnick did. He, the FBI was chasing him, and so he hacked the phone network, and he was tapping the FBI's phone calls as they tried to like hunt him down, so he was just making a monkey of them. He could hear them planning to arrest me here, so he'd go over here and then laugh at them. <laughs> and this, this is what tends to happen. I mean, if you're sending emails about the breach, you're probably doing yourself more harm than good. So use phone or um, cell phones if your voice over IP is compromised or some third party thing like Gmail. It's outside your servers entirely so people can communicate without the bad guys hearing everything you say. And then you've got resolution. So there's going to be a process to transition your compromised systems back to a trustworthy state so you can resume business on them. Now, you have to consider the risks here. While you are trying to fix the problem, then some of these systems are going to be unavailable, and that will do some harm. 
And um, so usually the incident response team wants to just take the compromised systems off the network immediately, but the business owner wants to leave them on the network and continue to run the business. And you have a, a tension here between these two objectives. So here's some recommended guidelines. Um, when you're, something's compromised, you should do, at least do something to protect it. Improve it in some way. Don't just ignore this problem. Uh, and then uh, don't tolerate an intruder. If you do tolerate an intruder, it's not only poor practice, but you're likely to have some kind of penalty, and then we're about to see this happen with Uber. I mean, if you have some kind of breach and you do nothing or you don't tell anybody, then when it does come out, They'll be mad at you for not having done anything about it. <laughs> so um, here's containment techniques. Putting your computer in hibernate mode is a good idea because you want to preserve RAM. The most important instant response data is usually volatile in RAM. It's usually not hard drive files. It's usually running processes, network connections, and, and mutexes, things that are in RAM. Um, you, can, you can deactivate the port at your firewall or something. That will stop the network traffic without bringing it down. You can uh, use a firewall rule to block it. You can have an access control list that stops traffic from coming in and out. You can change the routing so that it, traffic is no longer routed to or from that device. Uh, or you can block it anywhere in your network. Any of these things will prevent further communication with the device so the bad guys cannot continue stealing data from it. Now, one thing that Mandiant did, which I think gets in the next one, if you're really sophisticated, then you put them in a network that will simulate good stuff. Nandy has done this before, like somebody is in the process of stealing credit card numbers and we don't want to tip them off so they garbled the credit card numbers. They thought they were still stealing but they were getting junk. So they don't know they've been caught but you have stopped the loss. That's even cooler. All right, so now you're going to measure, the, the one big issue is the speed of containment. Um, the naive thought is as soon as I find a compromised host immediately like re-image it, replace it or something. But the problem is, if you ha don't detect things fast enough, then by the time you find one host, there's really 10 hosts. And all you do by fixing this one is alert the bad guys. And now they dig in deeper. So slower containment means you have more time to analyze the problem and hopefully get it all. That's why Mandy and always says that you have to let the attack go on for about another week while you monitor everything, find everything, and then blam, fix all the problems at once. Then you can kick them out and they're really out because you hopefully find all their points of infection. Of course, nothing's ever perfect, but that's the goal. So here's the recommendation. Um, contain it as quickly as possible, but only after you have determined the scope. You have to find out how big is the intrusion. Is it just one system? Are they in the firewalls? Are they in the printers? Are they in our backup images? Where are they? And when it all started with Google's APT1, and at that time, the Chinese were scary as hell. They were everywhere. They had time bombs on the network that would sleep for up to three years before waking up. So they were in the backups and on the other machines. And even when you think it's clean, it's not clean. Now we're going to wake up a few months later and start stealing your stuff again. You know, if, if your enemy is really serious about it, the scope can be very large. And it can be very hard to really know you clean things up. So you have to find out what the reach is decide what they've been to and this is your primary um one primary measure of the efficiency of your of your instant response team is how quickly can they actually determine a scope and perform containment so slow detection if you are one of these companies like three quarters of them or two-thirds of them that cannot detect intrusions at all and you only find out after the damage has been done and some external agency is telling you, then obviously it's too late for containment. <laughs> now, uh, turning off the one server with a virus alert is not even doing more than scratching the surface of it. It's spread too far. Uh, so you're not going to accomplish anything by taking hasty actions to try to mitigate it. Um, fast detection is what you need. If you develop your own threat intelligence and you can quickly find intruders on your own, then you might reasonably be able to find the problem and contain the victims in time. But you're going to have to have good detection to have any chance to have fast containment. So uh, here's another way to go about this is threat-centric, where you actually focus on the attackers. And this is appropriate if you are like a uh, critical infrastructure in America and you really think you have a nation state or a couple of nation states that are attacking you. So it's not like there's a million different people with different reasons to attack you. There's actually a small set of people attacking you and you can figure out what their goals are and understand why they're attacking you. And that helps. <coughs> One of the biggest cases of this was the Al-Qassam Cyber Army. 
the Al Qassam Cyber Army was a big deal about five years ago. And they were very clear, they announced publicly that they were a group of Islamic fundamentalists and they had one grievance. They did not like one video on YouTube. And they said, as long as you don't take this one video off YouTube, we are going to do a certain amount of dollars per month of damage to American banks. And they targeted banks with denial of service attacks in like 14 waves, each one smarter than the last. Everyone knew exactly who they were attacking, exactly why, and exactly how long they would attack. They all told you all this, and then you just had to try to block the attacks. It was sort of like the old days when you'd have a duel, and there are these rules, and they stand here and wait and count to three, and then they shoot once at you, and then they count to three again. It was not like crazy crime. It was like an organized form of warfare. Um, so sometimes you understand your enemy, and that helps. Um, so analyzing enemies does have some virtue for some people, like nation states. For an average company that's just being attacked by random hackers that want to steal things just to make money or just to make trouble, I think it is much less valuable to analyze the details of the attackers because they're pretty much just chaotic. But anyway, um, the other way to go is by you could focus on the attackers, that's threat sector, you could focus on the assets where you try to figure out what's valuable and then protect it. So the main thing you have to do is your incident response team has to really understand how the company works and how all the systems work so now they can more correctly um, design mitigations that will not impair the business. And this is something I hear a lot at conferences. Your, uh, a sloppy security team is just Dr. No. They say, no, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, and everybody hates them because you have to be able to do something to get the business done. So what you have to do is understand what the point of the business is and help them accomplish their business goals. You can't just say no to everything. They say, well, I need to use this fancy printer. They say, well, that printer is old and vulnerable. They say, well, tough, I need to print this stuff, so figure out a way to make it okay for me to use this printer. <laughs> Don't just tell me I can't. Figure out some defense that will not stop my business purpose. That's realistic. So you develop playbooks. If, if you're going through postmortems and, and documenting, you'll develop a list of your represented uh, responsibilities and the actions you take. And you will be able to identify campaigns. Your intruders come in waves, like military campaigns. They come to try to get something like that al Qassam Cyber Army. It only went on for a year or two. They had one goal. They accomplished some portion of their goal. Then they quit and went away. So you've got long-term operations. Another thing you can do is call them waves. And the author of your book says you should give them names. Some people name them after hurricanes and stuff because it helps motivate people. This is the wave of attacks from these people after this goal. Then another wave comes in maybe from the same or different people with a different goal. So you, you give it a name, you create a chat room or something about this, analyze your evidence, and you analyze your response to the wave. This is all modeling the military, where you have people attack, you have one battle, you defeat this one group of them, then they crawl back home and form another group and come back later. And it's uh, the same in the cyber world as in the real world, in general, overall terms. And so you measure the times for these things going on down here. You observe an event, you identify it, validate it, document it, then you notify somebody, get an acknowledgement that you notified them, then you have containment, so you stop the damage, and then you have remediation, where you fix all the problems and get things back to operational condition. And the time between those events is how you measure the value of your security incident response team. So that is the stuff at the bottom of this list, is the time of these things. Up here is just all the roles that have to happen, and down here is how you measure the quality of your team. So remediation is getting everything back to an operational state. There are some people that think you should clean things. I know home users do this all the time. My machine is full of vi viruses. Remove the viruses and I will keep using it. This is not generally considered a good idea in an enterprise environment. Only a few people like to do this. Most people say you should rebuild it from a known good backup or known good installation media because if a bad guy has gotten malware on it or otherwise gotten in, you don't really know what they've done. You might find five viruses, but there might be ten. There's just five you can find and five you can't find. So cleaning off what you can see does not really make a clean system. Typically, this is what makes a clean system. There are some people, like the guy that runs Kensec West, that imagines that they're ruining your hardware and you have to throw away the hardware. He's the guy that thinks the brand new Macs are being hacked by ultrasonic waves from other Macs. <laughs> there are people out there, in principle, you can do that. You can put malware in the, in the BIOS and on the NIC card. It's just, most of us don't believe that's happening very often. If it was happening, 
then you'd have to physically throw all the hardware or reflash <laughs> the, or re, uh, uh, most people, the middle one is what most people find reasonable. Yeah. Rebuild it from a known good backup. That's doable and that gives you reasonable confidence that it's clean. So that's what you do. Rebuild it from known good installation media or known good backups. Um, so if you have a system and you have a forensic reason to believe the adversary was changing this system, you find some files or registry keys to indicate they were on here, they were changing it, then you should re rebuild that system. But only after you've fully scoped the incident, of course. If you just rebuild the first couple of systems you find, then the adversary is tipped off that you have found them, but you haven't kicked them out, and they have a chance to hide deeper and put more malware on and everything. You want to wait until you scope the incident and rebuild all the affected systems and implement defense measures like new firewall rules or something. That's how you really get rid of somebody. And this is essentially humility. No matter how smart you are, you never really know what they did. You only find some evidence of what they did. The same thing's true of, of physical intruders or human diseases. You find some problems you understand, but there are other things going on that you don't understand. So this is your speed. Uh, you might, some people like to get from detection to containment in one hour. Other people like to get from adversary access to remediation in one hour. Um, but realistically, getting from detection to containment might well take weeks. It takes Mandiant weeks, typically. You bring in this team of people, you pay them a pile of money, they put networks detectors all over your system and something like security onion up, monitor everything, and it takes them a week or two to figure out what happened and figure out how to kick them out. All right, so you record those metrics and then you can take your boss. Right now, it takes us one year to find a breach and fix it, and if you hire more staff and buy us more stuff, we can do better, and maybe we should do that. that those numbers are what you can take to management to say, here's what we have and here's how much it would cost to do better. So um, you measure the speed. Um, and uh, so here's some examples. Um, once you have a relatively mature incident response team, you can now make intelligent business decisions. So here's some examples that are, in my opinion, very thinly veiled real products that are out there. So this guy wants to sell you NetFlow. I think I went to a, uh, a training from this vendor. They, um, NetFlow is the Cisco product that measures um, traffic into flows so you can easily, the original purpose of it was to control how much bandwidth everybody is consuming. But it can also be interpreted as a security measure. So they have special equipment you put in, it sends NetFlow to a printer console, you can now see what everybody's doing. But uh, the cert in this case says, well, we've already got that. Our glorious security onion <laughs> is, uh, is detecting all that and working because of Argus and stuff, which maybe it is for him, but it sure isn't for me. But anyway, in principle, if you had your Argus and Pro actually working, it would be giving you more than that product, so it's not worth buying. And the APT1 report came out. This is Mandiant dumping hundreds of thousands of pages with 3,000 indicators of compromise and 100 pages of tools. So you could totally use this to match, look for all these indicators of compromise and see if these guys are coming in and see if somebody is using tools like that. So that you might want to do. That's information you can put in your cert, just like antivirus definitions. Uh, that's a good thing. An asset inventory. If your time between detection to containment is weeks, you might talk to management. They might want to decrease it to under an hour. So if they're going to do that, one big thing would be have an asset management system so you always know what you're trying to defend. And uh, here, they, they had some vendor applied, proposed this, and everybody thought that was a great idea, and they put it in. I've seen quite a few of these. Um, Land Surveyor was one old one. There are others. Things that put an agent on every device and report back to a central thing just so you know what you've got. Uh, these things are popular even just to keep track of how many licenses you need for Microsoft Windows or Photoshop is another issue. But um, anyway, having some kind of automated asset management is a good start. So you actually know how many devices you're protecting. Network access control. We had a huge storm about this at the college back when we had our crooked CTO. He thought we had thousands of viruses on the network and we had to implement this. Network access control means that people connect and before they can connect, they have to prove their health. So like they have to prove that they have an up-to-date antivirus and all the Microsoft patches before they can connect. And that otherwise they get stuck in a quarantine network where they can download patches and stuff. This is something you might want to do. It's kind of expensive and burdensome, but it does clean up your network. So these guys wanted to do it. IT resists it, saying this is just a lot of hassle. It's going to mess up the help desk and everything. The incident response team really thought it would help, and so they managed to convince the other team to go for it. But instead of just having your CEO see a commercial and buy something, you hopefully have some kind of process where you make a reasonable decision about whether things are worth the bother or not. 
And so building a cert. Uh, many people just have one IT guy, and after the one IT guy can't handle it anymore, they get like one security guy. Remember, I think it was Twitter had no security guy for like the first five years. Then they got hacked like four times in a year, and then they said, we hired a security guy. <laughs> then they had one guy for a while. And you know, that is a step up, such as it is. So a lot of people are that one guy. That's pretty much what we have here. We have Tim as the IT guy, and he's also the security guy. Oh, wow. So he gets to spend like one third of his time securing the network. So he says, you know, well, you can talk about all this complicated stuff, but I need something that will just run without my attention. Yeah. <laughs> so I just have some automatic, automatic thing as much as possible. That's all he can do. Anyway, um, so if you want to justify staff, then get these metrics. Say, here's how many incidents we had. Here's how long it takes us to handle them. And then you ask management, is this really acceptable? And thanks to the vigorous activities of foreign military and LulzSec and everybody else, you can pretty much be guaranteed that when you confront management with the situation, they will give you more money. They'll say, wait a minute, we can't let it go on like this. And you can certainly show them news articles and say, it's only going to get worse. So if it's taking us three months to fix breaches now, you can guarantee next year there'll be twice as many breaches and they'll take us longer to fix them. Is that really what you want? Yeah. I think Mueller officially reported the losses um, because of WannaCry up to 600 million. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Huge losses. And so that's why it's, it's very easy if you are organized to shake money out of management saying, look, this is how much harm it's doing us. This is how much harm we expect it to be doing to us in the next couple of years. How about paying for a better security team? <laughs> but realistically, to, you don't deserve that money unless you have a plan to really make an effective team. If you're just going to buy some expensive crap that won't work, then management shouldn't give you the money. You should have a plan. I'm going to have these roles. I'm going to get these people. I'm going to put them in this structure that has been proven to work. And that's the point of this class and the point of this book is how to do it so that if you get money for five more staff, the end result is a better company, not just a bunch of idiots wasting money. Yeah, from my experience, the first thing that management asks you is a POV, proof of value. And then proof of what? Proof of value. Oh, proof so of value. Well, sure. Whatever you will buy, have. You have yeah. to prove it. Yeah. That's right. That's and, basically what you and do. That's just, well, basically, exactly like you have a feasibility plans. Yeah. Well, basically, much. you're like a startup. Positions. You have a pitch. You have an argument here saying, if you give me the money, it won't be wasted. I have a good plan that will actually return value, exactly. just like someone tries yeah. to get an investor. It doesn't have, it, it, proof might be a little too strong a word. That's what they use. But you, you, have, to have, they use, yeah. you have to have a persuasive argument. Yeah that says, I'm not just stealing the money, I'm not just wasting the money, I actually have a plan that will result in more security in business value. So anyway, here's um, the general computer instant response team structure. You have a director at the top, and I really was glad to see this written down in the book because this is absolutely true at every organization I've ever worked. The real purpose of the director is to protect your team from management. They're like an umbrella over you. We had a department chair here who did not understand this, but my boss certainly understood this. The point of management is to let your technical people work and stop upper management from messing it up, because they always will. They will just stop down and take your people, oh, you better fix my laptop, and you better do this, and all the people that have other things they should be doing are now doing stupid, unproductive things to please upper management. So this guy's real job is to protect them from the other managers. And now you have technical people that can work. So you have instant detection and response here, and these are the people we talked about before. You've got event analysts at the bottom that are your junior people that are just matching known indicators of compromise from some other source, like MD5 hashes or something. You got people in the middle, and you got the people at the top who can actually do hunting because they're so experienced they can actually find new threats without signatures. And so those are the three levels here. And over here you got more uh, threat intelligence people, and you got infrastructure development people. And we'll go through those in the slides that are coming up. And below them, you've got your constituent relations team, which are the people that talk to the rest of the people in the company to explain to them what's going on, like public relations, kind of. So you have these technical people. And the thing about technical people is you can't be interrupting them all the time. And they're working on something complicated. And they usually don't care much about the bigger picture. They care about one little thing, like I'm going to take apart this virus and put it in Ida Pro and find out what it really did, something like that. So you have to have protection from other people wasting their time. And you also have to have somebody up here who really has the, good, the big picture in mind, that you can talk to their management and explain. Because these people don't usually have any vision of the big picture. 
I've tried complaining to these people, like the page you just put up violates federal law and the company's going to get shut down, and they don't do anything. They can't even hear me. They're saying, oh, no, I'm writing another code. I'm debugging this code. This guy's babbling about laws. It's not my job. My job is to just write software, and the fact that it's breaking a law and destroying the whole company is nowhere in my mind. I'm just trying to get the bugs out. It's up here that people are thinking about that. So the director of incident response organizes, trains, and equips them. They then detect deputies to assist them with the mission to handle the people beneath them. And their main job is to go have lunch with the boss and explain that everything's under control and make it so the boss feels like, you know, cooperate with the boss so the boss's goals are achieved without the boss having to go around them and micromanage, which will ruin everything. Um, so here's the three people. Your analysts are the new people at the bottom that are just obeying simple prescriptions like see how many machines have this file on it. The people in the middle are trying to make it up to be able to hunt where they can find things without those rules. And the people are training each other and moving up the ranks. Beginners will start here as analysts, event analysts, where you just find an event and see if it matches your rules. This is sort of like the frontline help desk where you just look to see if this is one of the five most common problems. And if it's not, then escalate it to the other guy. Um, so all these analysts have access to all the data, but um, the people at the bottom can only classify certain events. They have a limited scope. Anything beyond that scope, they escalate to someone else. And the uh, higher level people train the other people and take them on trips and try to enlighten them about how to do the more difficult job to see how many of them can be promoted to the more valuable job up above. Then you've got your Threat Intelligence Center. These are people doing um, internal, doing intelligence activities. And internal security consultant, adversary simulation, red teaming, and pen testing. These are the people uh, deciding what threats are out there. So your intelligence team provides reports. And they search for indicators of compromise and adversary tools and techniques. And they also um, are consultants inside your company to help other people fix their security problems as needed. The red team are the people that try to think of ways to attack the company and find weaknesses. The blue team are the people that try to fix problems, as your internal security consultants who go around and help people patch problems. And then you have an infrastructure and development center. These are the people that are writing code to be used by the incident response team. Because typically, the incident response team has people who write proof of concept, like most hackers at a conference. I've done this too. You have some idea, you write some code, you go to a conference and show it off, and your code proves that it's working, but it's not really good enough for anyone else to use, like this stinking security onion stuff, right? It apparently is good for somebody, but when you actually install it on our machines and try to work, it doesn't work very well. I would call it a proof of concept kind of thing. Um, so you do that. That's a good thing, but when you act, then you actually want someone writing more professional code like Splunk that will really work every time, and that's what these guys do. They're making tools for your incident response team to use. And uh, then you have the constituent relations at the bottom of that diagram. These are people that represent the incident response team outside the company and talk to other constituents. So you have to be protected from political interference at the bottom of the top, so you can focus on technical things in the middle. So. Five questions. So what method should be avoided when you're discussing response to an intrusion? The email is probably just under the control of the attacker. So which one of these is a bad containment measure? is a bad move because you lose the <coughs> volatile data. All right, what's the main risk of fast containment? the main problem is that you won't get them all. You jump on the first thing you see, and there were other problems you failed to detect. All right. 
And what's the recommended way to remediate after a server intrusion? Rebuilding is good, ignoring is popular, but not recommended. All right. All right, here are the winners. All right, no, we're done? No, we're not done. They fooled me with that. There's another one. Okay. So who's the most experienced analyst who does hunting? Person at the top, the most experienced one. All right.